The poet Hafiz wrote, I know the way you can get when you have not had a drink of love. I know the way you can get when you've had not a drink of love. Your face hardens. Your sweet muscles cramp. Children become concerned about a strange look that appears in your eyes. Children become concerned about a strange look that appears in your eyes, which even begins to worry your own mirror and nose. Squirrels and birds sense your sadness and call an important conference in a tall tree, and they decide which code to chant to help your mind and soul. Even angels fear that brand of madness that arrays itself against the world and throws sharp stones and spears into the innocent and into oneself. Oh, I know the way you can get if you have not been drinking love. You might rip apart every sentence your friends and teachers say, looking for hidden clauses. You might weigh every word on a scale like a dead fish. You might pull out a a ruler to measure from every angle in your darkness the beautiful dimensions of a heart you once trusted. I know the way you can get if you have not had a drink from love's hand. That is why all the great ones speak of the vital need to keep remembering God so you will come to know and see him as being so playful and wanting, just wanting to help. That's why God says, bring your cup near me, for all I care about is quenching your thirst for freedom. All a sane man can ever care about is giving love. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. And God abides in them. Did you hear that? Did you really hear that? God is love. God, the creator of the sun and the moon and the stars who just put on a magnificent totality show this week. God the creator of lions and wolves and eagles and dolphins and hummingbirds and trouts and belly f- uh, butterflies and jellyfish and you and me. God is love. God, the one who created protons and electrons and neutrons, dark matter, gravitational waves, magnetic fields, cosmic rays, neutrinos. God, that God is love. And according to John, because God is love, we also ought to love one another. And while each of us has to make that decision all the time, know that God has already made the decision and loves you and loves me eternally. And so when we make that decision, we're not initiating the process. We're continuing it. We're participating in something that has begun long before us, that sustains us even now and is the point of our existence. For love requires no pushing of the river. It's simply about stepping into it, surrendering to it, and letting it take you to all the people and places that God already loves. A student approached his master teacher and asked her, what is love? And the master teacher said that love is the total absence of fear. So the student asked, and what is it that we fear most? And the teacher said, love. Love is what we fear. Why would we fear the very force that created us and sustains us and is the sole purpose for our being here on earth? And yet we are afraid of love. We're afraid to love and we are afraid to be loved even though John says here that there ought to be no fear in love. 
But perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. So we all have a lot of work to do to reach that perfect love that casts out fear. But maybe it begins with acknowledging that the opposite is true. Perfect fear casts out love. It keeps us from love. And we are a fearful people. We seem to be more afraid than ever. And there are forces conditioning us to be afraid. Those forces are many and varied, but surely they are the 24-hour infotainment channels leading us to be afraid through sensationalism and negativity, leading us to believe the world is more dangerous than it is. We are conditioned by societal pressures to conform to certain standards of success and beauty and behavior that instill in us a fear of failure or rejection or inadequacy. We are conditioned by an advertising industry that plays and preys upon our insecurities to sell products reinforcing the notion that we are incomplete without these products. And all of this seems to just be exacerbated by the tablets and devices that are increasingly at the center of our lives. These devices and tablets, which do, some, in some cases, wonderful things, keep us a step away from each other, being in the physical presence of each other. They keep us a step away from being out there in the physical, natural world, in the places that nourish the soul and ground us in reality. They keep us separate from those places, and they bring us one step closer to those forces that want to manipulate us and make us more and more afraid. They give us access to those principalities and powers conditioning us to be afraid. So at the same time, we are increasingly starved from the things that really do nourish the human soul, and we're given a whole lot of junk food, which doesn't nourish us. And so we are afraid. And because we are afraid, we are so much more easy to be, or it's so much easier for people to manipulate us, to get us to do what they want us to do. Maria Reza, author of How to Stand Up to a Dictator, points out that lies spread six times as fast on the internet, and lies laced with fear, anger, and hatred spread even faster. She wrote that during the Black Lives Matter riots, Russian bots provided misinformation, promoted it to the left and to the right. They had no other agenda. They weren't advocating for one side or the other. They just wanted to divide us. And they did a pretty good job. It worked. And people paid attention. And political leaders are increasingly savvy about using social media and the internet because they understand that 80% of political decisions are not based on fact, but on emotion. On emotion. And so the goal of so many people in power is to manipulate us by getting us all worked up about what the other side is planning to do. To try to make one set of people Forget that certain other sets of people are human, to quote Aldous Huxley. It's pretty depressing, isn't it? At a time when misinformation is disseminated so quickly and widely, it feels hopeless at times, and yet Raisa is one of the voices, one of the advocates who's working right now in the Philippines to re-strengthen democratic principles in the face of authoritarianism. And she is arguing, I think quite compellingly, that the only way to fight against those seeking to control the narrative through lies and propaganda is to promote inspiring stories of resistance and solidarity which can also spread rapidly, creating a ripple effect that amplifies the voices of dissent and challenges the dominance of falsehood. But I think there's something deeper at play. Why is it that lies 
are so seductive today and seem to grab hold of us so powerfully. I think there's a, a big lie that we got to look at that undergirds all the other lies. I think Western culture in some ways was built upon an overstatement, a lie. And our culture, which we think in ways was built upon Jesus and Paul, really was built more upon Plato and Aristotle. And Aristotle argued that each thing has a substance and is in relation to other things, and he gave primacy to substance over everything else. And so the goal of the early Christian theologians, in order to fit into this world, tried to argue that God was a substance. And the implications for Western theology and philosophy have been staggering. We have been taught that we're separate Substance, separate from God, separate from each other. We've been conditioned to believe that the goal of human life is to become independent, self-sufficient, self-reliant. And we wonder why we're so afraid and so lonely. But ironically enough, our best friend today as Christians is science. Science is our best friend. They are helping us, the scientists, reclaim the vision of Jesus and Paul, a vision that we couldn't even understand because we were swimming in the waters of dualism. We now know that none of us are truly independent. We know this. We are interdependent. We exist in relationship to all things. We have complex systems working within us and all around us. There's the respiratory system. There's the circulatory system. There's the ecosystem. There's the solar system of which we're all a part. We are not separate from those systems. But because we've been swimming in the waters of Greek dualism, we haven't been able to understand texts like the ones we just read today. We couldn't appreciate how the Bible is inviting us into participation with God, to be instruments, conduits of God's love, to let God's love flow through us. These teachings were kind of pushed to the margins. We didn't understand them. It didn't make sense to many of us who believed that God was some separate entity from us that was so angry with us that we just had to make him be less angry and try to get into his good graces by behaving better. That's where so many of us are stuck theologically. And we wonder why we're so afraid and why we're so lonely. We couldn't understand Jesus. We couldn't understand Paul. We couldn't understand John. We couldn't understand that God is eternally connected to us. And we are eternally connected to each other. And God is the power at work trying to reconnect us to one another. We couldn't understand how God could be the vine growing power that wants to bear fruit in and through us. We couldn't understand what Jesus was talking about when he prayed that we would be one the way he is one with God and with others. We couldn't understand that God is more a verb than a noun. How God is more the ground of all being than a separate being. How God is less a substance and more a relationship. Or maybe, as Ramon Panikar says, pure relationality. I get it that this theology sometimes is hard for us to integrate, but it's a game changer. It's a game changer. With this understanding of our interconnectedness and God's interconnected with us, with us, living with faith is about staying in relationship. It's about abiding in God who already abides in us. And being living in sin is trying to do it all by yourself, being self-sufficient, self-reliant. With this theology, living in faith is embracing the fact of our mutuality. And living in sin is checking out, wanting no part of that mutuality. Or to quote C.S. Lewis, living in faith is saying, I need help. And living in sin is saying, 
I don't need help. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. But don't take my word for it. What's the central message of our faith? That God came in person in Jesus to live life as we do, to be vulnerable as we are. And what was Jesus having to do on this earth? He had to rely on the love of a mother and the love of his father. He needed air. He needed food. He needed water. He needed people all around him. And when he grew up, he didn't grow out of his need for people. He surrounded himself with more people, men and women, fishermen. And they lived life together. He taught them. He learned with them. They went out into the world to minister. And then when he was preparing to leave, what did he do? He gave them a vision for how they were to live life together. And he promised that he would be with them even after he died. This is good stuff. This is our message. Jesus shows us how to live. He shows us that we have to learn how to be vulnerable. We have to stay in relationship with God and others at all costs. We must embrace our mutuality. We are called to follow in his footsteps, to live life as he did, and to reject the illusion that somehow we're separate individuals and to affirm the truth that we're deeply connected. I think that's what Paul is getting at in his famous discourse on love. When he was a child, he didn't understand this. He spoke like a child. He reasoned like a child. But when he became an adult, he put an end to childish ways. And he realized in the end, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest is love. I was reminded just recently of the final days of Thomas Merton's life. In his later years, this Christian man became increasingly passionate about building bridges and relationships with people and leaders from other faith traditions. He traveled to Bangkok, Thailand, where he was one of the speakers among many different leaders from different traditions. And he arrived, he went, got into his hotel And he was getting ready for the conference. He took a bath, and tragically, the light above him fell into the bathtub, electrocuting him and killing him. We don't know for sure what he was going to say, but we do have his journals, and we know what he had been writing. And here's what he wrote the evening before he died. He said, the deepest level of communication is not communication but communion. It is wordless, beyond words, beyond speech, beyond concepts. Not that we discover a new unity, we discover an older one. And then he writes these words, which seem like they were supposed to be shared with others. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, we are already one, but we imagine that we're not. We are already one, but we imagine that we are not. And what we must recover is our original unity. Mm. It makes you wonder where love was leading Merton. It makes you wonder where love was leading Peter last week when Jesus kept looking him in the eye and saying, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Do you wonder where love might be leading you? Where love might be leading us? What would it look like for us to reclaim our original unity? To see that river, to step into it, to surrender to it, to participate in it, and to realize that all a sane man or woman can ever do is give love. Amen.